The great majority of flowering plants actually depend on animal pollinators to help them spread the pollen to the carpels so that fertilization can happen. And this is a great illustrative example of one of the AP Biology Essential Knowledge Statements. The different species sometimes need to cooperate to ensure the survival of the species. So the plants benefit because they can reproduce. How do the animals benefit? Well, these flowers actually produce something called nectar, which is a very sugary, sweet substance that is down inside the flower. And when the pollinator comes, it gets it for food. So the pollinator doesn't know that it's actually helping the plant reproduce. All it knows is that it's going after this nice sugary food. Now the plants have evolved structures to help pollinators know that there's nectar inside for them. And some of these are called nectar guides, such as the one shown in this picture, where in these um, iris flowers you can actually see white arrows that are pointing towards the center of the flower, as if to tell the pollinator, look, there's nectar inside, come and get it. And there was actually a really interesting um, experiment done where the researchers took purple ink and they covered up these white arrows and then looked to see what happened. And the plants that had the arrows covered up actually did not get pollinated. The pollinators approached the flowers, but they did not actually land on the flower. So the plants did not get pollinated and they were not able to reproduce. So it does actually take a plant quite a bit of energy to produce structures such as petals and nectar guides and then to produce the nectar. But the energy is a worthwhile investment because it's an investment in helping the plant reproduce and pass on its genes. Now, angiosperms and pollinators, remember angiosperms are flowering plants, they're actually a great example of something called coevolution, which you might have already learned about when you learned about evolution. Coevolution is when an adaptation in one species actually helps to drive the evolution of a different species. So for example, if um, among different hummingbirds, a particular hummingbird happens to have a slightly longer beak that helps it reach down to get the nectar in a really long flower, then it benefits because it gets more food and is more likely to reproduce. And vice versa, if the flower, say, happens to have a color that attracts the pollinator to itself or a smell that attracts the pollinator, it's more likely to get to reproduce. And there's really great examples of um, co-evolution in flowering plants and pollinators and how plants actually attract the pollinators. So, and this is also an illustrative example of this essential knowledge statement that organisms need to exchange information that they respond to external cues to change their behavior. So pollinators will respond to cues from the flowers to come um, and pollinate the flowers. For example, in this corpse flower, it's named a corpse flower because it actually stinks. It smells like rotting flesh. Why? Well, the rotting flesh smell helps to attract flies that act as the pollinators of this flower. Another really weird example is this other plant called the Cuban vine, which has its leaves have this shape that actually ha helps bats, their preferred pollinators, to locate the flowers using echolocation. Bats, bats have really poor vision, they can't see. To help them find objects, they actually make the sound and then they wait for the echo to come back to tell them how far away the object is from them. So in this case, they can find these flowers and their nectar by emitting a sound and then here the plant, it echoes back from this leaf and the bat can more easily find these flowers that are underneath and pollinate them. I think that's pretty cool research. And then this other really weird example is this hammer orchid that gets pollinated by wasps. Now, this weird structure actually resembles a female wasp. It even has makes certain chemicals that are like the pheromones that wasps make. 
and these pheromones will attract a male wasp. The male wasp thinks this is a female. It lands on it and tries to fly off with it to mate, <laughs> but it's attached. You know, with a female wasp, the female wasp would normally fly off with the male wasp. But so the male lands here and then tries to fly off and instead it's sort of catapulted to here where the anthers are and it picks up the pollen. Then it flies to another, it sort of realizes, wait, this is not a female wasp. So it flies off, but then at some point it will find another hammer orchid, again, think that there's a female wasp, tries to mate with it, and then the pollen that's, um, that's covering its body will now be delivered to the female reproductive, the carpal, and it gets pollinated. There's lots of other really cool examples of how flowers attract pollinators. And if you're interested, go to YouTube and uh, watch a video called Sexual Encounters of the Floral Kind. Part two actually uh, talks about the hammer orchid and it then the other sections talk about other really cool examples. Now I have to go on to a more serious topic. And that is that currently there's a huge problem in that honeybees are dying out. I'm talking about this because it's a great illustrative example of one of the AP Biology Essential Knowledge statements that human activities impact ecosystems, often in negative ways. So beekeepers are losing their honeybees in huge numbers, and this is being called the colony collapse disorder. We don't fully yet know why it's happening. One group of researchers believe that it's a viral infection and a fungal infection that together weaken the bee enough that it dies. It's virus and fungal, how do humans play a role? Well, one way that we play a role in that beekeepers are shipping bees all over the country to pollinate what needs to be pollinated. And in doing so, a lot of diseases are being spread around. Now think about what would happen if the honeybees actually went extinct? What would be the result? Well, for one thing, no more honey. Honeybees make the honey from the nectar that they collect from flowers. What would be another big result? Well, if honeybees are the pollinators, then the plants that depend on them for pollination would not be able to reproduce and they could also go extinct. That means no more apples, no more pears, no more watermelon, no more eggplant, avocado, coconut, almonds, I could go on. It would be a huge food shortage. So we need to pay attention. And if you're interested in learning more about this topic, I encourage you to look up a New York Times article from 2007 titled Our Decrepit Food Factories. And now please go on to part three of the plant reproduction and development lesson to continue and to learn about the flowering plant life cycle.